like they can leave. They can just have a lot to do today. So we're going to try to be on time. We're waiting on Doug. He's just not quite <coughs> ready. Hopefully he'll be here in a few minutes. And I would ask you to pay attention, uh, first of all, to review your consent agenda. Hopefully everybody's had time to do that. Make sure you're aware of that, and then we'll have action on that uh, tomorrow. Madam Chair, the only thing I might mention that I talked with the Steve Owens, the general counsel, and I'm going to offer on his behalf a few technical amendments uh, tomorrow. Okay. So we might need time outside of consent just to consider a technical amendment. Okay. Thank you. Any, anybody else? Any other additions to the consent it. agenda? <laughs> if not, uh, I would ask that you consider a resolution to go into executive session. That is an action item. I need a so moved. And a second, please. Second. Been moved and seconded to go into executive session. That'll be a combination of maybe today, maybe all tomorrow, depending on our schedule. Not now. No, that's later. Um, any further discussion on that matter? If not, we'll call the roll. Yes. 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 Um, our next order of business is committee meetings, and we'll go to COP and Human Resources. I would remind you that we are being web streamed, so make sure you're clear with any comments that you have. And we also are going to be uh, connecting on the phone with a consultant. Uh, he is on the line right now, but he won't come on until uh, a later portion of that. And I turn that over to Warren. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and welcome everybody to the University of Missouri Compensation and Human Resources Committee. Today we're going to continue the ongoing discussion and dialogue that we have had now actually for many years on the status of our benefits programs to our em employees. Uh, we're going to focus on a couple areas of those benefit programs today. Uh, I think Gary is going to open our discussion with a few comments and then turn it over to Betsy and we'll have a presentation. Uh, I believe there's also an outside consultant who's joining this conversation who has some expertise in the actuarial uh, area and uh, would be available to uh, all of us for questions as well as his Betsy. So with that, I'll turn it over to the President, or to Betsy, for, for her comments. Um, I'll go, go to the first slide here. I just want to take a minute to share some um, not so good news and, and then some news that's a little bit better. Um, each year we try to give you a sense of what's going on with our benefit plans. And uh, we have some bad news on our medical plan. We don't look that different than most of the places across the country, unfortunately. And we are going to see about a 13% increase. We'll be sending some additional information out to employees about this, but I wanted you all to know this. Um, it's important to note that we are maintaining our 73-27% split, so employees don't bear the full cost of an increase. We share in that just as we do the overall premium. I'll talk for just a second about why we're seeing those increases. And the first reason is really just increase in medical costs, and that's really happening across the country. The second reason is uh, we have more utilization on our plan than we have in the last few years, and I'm particularly concerned about it in some areas that we think are preventable. And so we would like to start taking a really deep dive into some wellness issues and trying to do uh, maybe some wellness incentives with our with our uh, campuses, and in fact, I would point out that Chancellor Carney has a nice pilot started on the Rolla campus with uh, minors on the move, and we're, we've, got, we're, we've got big expectations of them that they will bring that home for us. Um, also, we had some state mandates that increased cost, and then finally, because of health care reform, we had to expand our definition of dependent children, which is some don't consider age 26 children, but that is uh, the new definition, and so we um, had to in include that cost as well. The good news is we don't have cost increases on our other plans, in particular on dental. In fact, on dental, we think we have good news. We have a new provider at network, and we believe that will actually reduce costs for employees who choose to use that network. So if there are no questions on that, we'll move into retirement. President Forsey?
I want to start uh, the introduction to uh, Betsy's presentation by, uh, I guess I heard the term a few years ago, chalking the playing field, uh, just to kind of set the uh, framework for um, really a continued discussion, as Warren said, about uh, our examination of the retirement plan, and in this case the project, if you will. Um, we take this issue very seriously. Uh, we do all aspects of our employee compensation, the total compensation, whether it's salary, health care benefits that Betsy just talked about, or in this case, um, retirement benefits. And by the way, um, this message applies as we care about that for current employees and those that have served and retired from the university. So the message ought to be twofold in that regard. You know, I believe uh, we have demonstrated that sincerity uh, by the deep review that we did two years ago uh, on our salary situation, uh, where it was very clear that we are uh, below market and have work to do there, and we've been obviously striving to, uh, to make improvements there. And also with the very deep review that we did last year of employee preferences about their benefits, and obviously we did that across the breadth of the university, uh, staff, faculty, administrators, to be sure we understood uh, what they thought about our plans and how plans should be uh, adjusted or invested in over time. Uh, Betsy and her staff, in my view, have worked tirelessly really to communicate uh, but also listen to employee concerns about benefits uh, during this period of time. The presentation this afternoon uh, obviously is with the Board of Curators as the uh, uh, principal and primary audience, but we have invited uh, employees uh, across the system to listen in in order that they can stay abreast of the discussions that we're having uh, with the Board of Curators, uh, discussions that will continue to evolve over the next several months uh, with presentation of data, uh, and that will continue uh, with employee meetings uh, that Betsy and, and I will be attending over the next several months. Two years ago, uh, we took a very decisive action, having employees contribute uh, to the pension plan, and we did that as a further mitigation uh, action, uh, attempting to ensure that our plan remain, as it has historically, uh, fully funded. And this followed the previous action by our board uh, to build a reserve to help, help smooth out potential uh, added funding obligations that may occur over time. These were actions taken uh, to get ahead of the curve, and certainly as it related to the funding issue, we indicated as such that this was a planning effort. It wasn't about necessarily the here and now and a shortfall that may have occurred uh, based on the recession that was just starting two years ago, but looking ahead uh, to be sure that our plan remained actuarially fully funded, able to meet our future obligations as we move forward. And whether we did it adequately at that point in time, that, that should have had a big caveat, uh, because we know that as the economy uh, in our country has evolved, as well as within our state, uh, there have been uh, many episodes along the way that have been actually further setbacks to economic improvement in the past three years. So whether we were explicit uh, and ensuring that uh, all of our actions and discussions about our pension plan needed to be contemporary, certainly I will say that today. Uh, we are now uh, fully into three years of this recession, and as we look to the future, we know that some of the fundamental assumptions that had been uh, the underpinning of our historic defined benefit plan become even more challenging based on how those assumptions are act actuarially uh, uh, dealt with and certainly the impact as we look to the future continues. So Betsy will cover uh, in some detail what has changed about those underpinning assumptions and how that change actually projects into the future. You know, one of the things that's been confusing, I'm sure, to employees is as these pieces get uh, put in the mixing bowl, they get confusing. And we certainly have had a fair amount of confusion over the past uh, six or seven months as we uh, we're pretty declaratory that we were going to examine and do a deep dive on our pension plan uh, as a result of these economic factors. So let me take a shot at ensuring that the peace parts are clearly understood. For retirees, there is no plan uh, or action or any agenda that would change uh, the plan payout that retirees are currently uh, achieving. So retirees can, again, understand that all of the discussions we're having aren't attempting to adjust the formula, aren't attempting to adjust any of the expectations for retirees. For active employees, there is no, again, plan to change that plan design at this juncture. The plan payment, the basic structure of the plan, uh, the expected defined outcome of that plan, there's no plan for current employees to see a change in that regard. The question, and if you will, kind of the 
big moose on the table is how do we ensure that that plan remain fully funded? That's the issue. The issue for current employees is to ensure that we have a funding mechanism as we know that contribution rates as a result of the factors that we already talked about uh, are going to continue to be in front of us. Uh, it is one pot of money, uh, and the pot of money has to deal with salaries, and we know where we are with salaries, has to deal with health care costs, and obviously has to deal with pension plan contributions. So the submission is that as future risk and liability continues to build, the question that we ask ourselves, the Board of Curators ask ourselves, aren't there mitigating strategies that should be considered? I mean, that's the fundamental, simplest way of looking at this. As risk continues to build with the current plan, are there mitigating strategies that should be considered? So it's with that backdrop that, once again, and this board has looked at this issue uh, several times uh, during some of your tenure on the board, uh, to be sure that we look at the potential uh, for a defined contribution plan to be brought to the university for new employees that come on board. That's the way we are bounding this issue, narrowly associated with uh, establishing a defined contribution plan for new employees. Our challenge will be to design or engineer that plan so as not to have an unintended consequence, uh, as we described already, for existing employees or retirees. We think that can be achieved so that our costs don't have an unnecessary or uh, uh, unpredictable level of increase as we go through that and we don't have a, again, exacerbated funding requirement for that defined benefit plan. There is no plan. There is no plan to allow existing employees to opt into such a defined contribution plan. That could be a future decision that we opt to take. Uh, and, and obviously, current employees, uh, many have expressed interest in that. But we have no plan as part of this recommendation that we may consider to the board uh, as early as December. We have no plan uh, to allow existing employees to opt in. And obviously, we have no plan to force existing employees uh, to participate in such a defined uh, contribution plan were we to make that to the board. So all this is work in progress uh, with an assumption that we will make a recommendation to the board, but that's not clear. We have work to do, and certainly the functional expertise of Betsy and her staff and our advisors would move us in that direction. So again, at one level, uh, I think it's pretty simple. Can we change, can we make a change in our pension plan design to reduce the university's risk? And I, by the way, I would submit to you that if we were able to do that, uh, we would reduce current employees and retirees' risk along the way because those two, I think, are linked as we think about uh, pension plan risk and the national discussion that's going underway about that. So again, the premise is can we design a plan that reduces university risk and by the way, won't that at the same time reduce existing employees and retirees' risk as well? Can we uh, design a plan that has today unpredictable funding requirements, as we know the upheaval that occurs in the down cycles, uh, for more predictability. So changing out an unpredictable funding requirement, and certainly in our case, unpre unpredictable funding sources to meet that need for something that's more predictable. And I think the final point would be, can we design a plan that's attractive for us to recruit and retain as satisfactorily as our existing plan has been for decades. We've had a very successful run, and, uh, and that certainly is something that culturally we want to be sure that as we design a plan and if we were to bring that forward, that it can be as attractive uh, for us to recruit and retain employees along their, their life cycle as our current plan has been in, the, in place. You know, at the end of the day, uh, it will be a judgment call. Uh, the data can be debated. Uh, the facts, uh, I think, can be presented uh, to work our way through that. But at the end of the day, it will be a judgment call uh, by administration, by our functional leadership to make a presentation to the board. Uh, our commitment is we will do our very best to produce those facts. We have laid out a schedule now uh, for the course of this fall, including a uh, uh, perhaps a half a day session or more uh, with the committee, and certainly the total board would be invited to participate in that. We will present cases that are parallel to ours. Uh, we aren't unique. Uh, this has been repeating itself uh, for years now uh, with public companies and been repeating itself for years now uh, with state employees, been repeating itself for years now in higher education institutions. So this is not an unknown issue. We will be sure that we present 
uh, during the course of this fall these issues to our employees. We've committed to do that, and we will do our best to be sure that employees understand the alternatives, understand what's in play here and what's not. And we will be sure that we listen to questions and listen to that input. But I will also say that we are going to need the attention, uh, the help of administrators, of staff and faculty leaders. I will be expecting leaders to lead. Uh, Betsy will work herself uh, silly uh, making rounds around our campuses and around our state, and I will be with her uh, for part of that anyway. But at the end of the day, leaders will have to lead. The communication will have to be clear. The input will have to be taken. And again, that's our commitment to do that. So with that, let me uh, turn this over to Betsy, but I wanted to be sure that we provided uh, some context, that we took some things perhaps off the table that have been concerning employees, and I think this is responsive to our board to have a process that leads us uh, somewhat methodically uh, toward a December timeline if that can be met, and certainly we'll continue to uh, keep you apprised if we think that's achievable or not along the way. This afternoon is, again, a data sharing uh, and fact sharing and some assum assumption reconciliation. Okay. Thank you, and I appreciate you all taking the time to go through this today. Um, and on the phone we have Howard Rogg. And Howard, if you could just at least say hello so everyone can hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. It worked. <laughs> Howard Rogg has been our longtime actuary on our current defined benefit plan. He's with Siegel Company and can answer questions if there's specific questions that, um, that I can't um, address. So with our first slide, uh, what is the retirement plan project? I think President Forsey um, covered what this is and probably more importantly, what it is not. Um, what we need to do is determine what our guiding principles and objectives are, and this is actually the last slide that I'm going to leave you with um, at the end of my presentation. Those really drive uh, plan design, and I think they're important considerations that we need to work through. Um, we're, gonna, we're in the process of evaluating our current plan, and I'm going to show that to you in a minute. Uh, we'll need to fully analyze our costs and our risks and need to be, uh, ensure, we need to ensure that we're, that we're poised for both the short-term and the long-term um, issues that come up, and most importantly, to make sure that we can deliver a total compensation package that's of value to our employees at the different phases of, of their career with us. And then finally, we'll consider what matters to faculty and staff. We've been doing that across, I've been doing that across the summer. I'll continue to do that through the fall. The President's going to um, do some of these presentations as well, and we'll be having some campus leaders uh, join us with that. The most important thing is there just is no one perfect total compensation package, and we know from our employee survey that the demographics really drive preferences and people's ages and salaries and where they are in their career. And so we'll just have to consider all of those things. And the one thing that we do know for sure, and that's really the, the last bullet on here, and I'll reemphasize what President Forsey said, we really have no intention of, of taking away the current defined benefit plan that people are in. That's really not what this project is about. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to put this in context. Um, you've heard already uh, the, the concern that a lot of faculty and staff have, and what they are really concerned about is what impact this will have on the current plan, and that's one of those things we just have to get out there and talk to employees, <laughs> let them talk to us, and we need to share some data with them. Um, but regardless of what happens moving forward with any kind of an alternative, it's important to note, and that's really my point in coming to you today, there are some issues with the current DB plan that we need to talk about. So with the next slide, um, let me get into um, why we do this project. And this is really about, the number one issue is really about mitigating the long-term risks to the institution. Um, this is not just about what's going on in the economy now, but it's, as we look forward, what are the long-term risks and can we sustain a total compensation package when one piece of that package has some significant issues and is one of the significant drivers of that package. So that's really the number one reason why we're doing this project, is to look at those long-term risks. The second one is to look at benefit flexibility. We have a wonderful current plan that has served us very well for many years. We're starting to hear that there are changing and evolving needs with employees, and we maybe should consider some alternatives. As we put a significant amount of money into the retirement plan, we need to evaluate that and make sure that's where we still feel that we're getting the most value for our dollars. As President Forsey mentioned, it's one pot of money, and we're putting a significant portion of it into that, that and we think an increasing amount will need to go in there. So let's talk for a minute about why the Defined Benefit Plan has been so successful, because it, it truly has served the university very well. Um, one of those reasons is it encourages and rewards long service. 
And that's not true on, on all retirement plans, depending on the way they're structured. But ours clearly does. In fact, full benefits can only really be achieved at age 62 or older, mostly at 65, depending on how long employees have been there. Second, our plan is very unique from our peers. And many of you know that our peers have mostly defined contribution plans, at least for their faculty. And so that really sets us aside. And given that we've had a fairly low salary position over the years, this has served us very well to have a very attractive retirement package that's in fact different. I'll describe this in a minute, but actually our third point here is that plan is a little unique in and of itself in that it's a hybrid plan and it offers a small cash out opportunity so it's not just a benefit at the time that somebody retires. It's not equivalent to what you'd have in a defined contribution plan, but it is a, a pretty significant difference than what you would see in some defined uh, that, that's pure, can pure I plans. Can I intervene real quickly uh -huh. before I lose track? Because I, I think the rest of the board, you educated me, you have up there that the UM plan is significantly different from its peers. Could you explain to the board and those listening as to why our benefit plan is significantly different from our peers? Because it's a defined benefit plan and that just has a completely different structure and risk set up than a defined contribution plan. So it's guaranteeing a retirement benefit or in the, in the university is bearing the risk for that versus a defined contribution which is a cash accumulation type retirement plan. But the way you've described it to me, our peers would have a defined benefit plan but it would not be a standalone plan in which the university bears the entire risk. Rather, it would be tied into an operation like Moser's in which it would be a state funded plan where the state bears the risk as opposed to the university bearing the risk alone. Is that that's, it's correct that most of the universities that offer a defined benefit do so through the state. Um, however, the university does share in the risk because the university is subject to whatever the contribution amount is that the state sets. So it's still bearing, it's still in essence bearing the risk of that. Um, and then finally, I want to mention that there's been an awful lot of, and this really gets to the last bullet here, there's been a lot of media attention on retirement plans and particularly focused on those plan features that are typically pretty expensive and have been at significant risk. And our plan does not have some of those features and that's why our plan has been so successful. Um, the folks before me made some very good decisions about that plan and we're in, we're in relatively good financial situation. The first one is that we spread our financial risk over five years and obviously we've had some volatility in our rates which I'll show you in a minute, but we'd have even more so if we weren't um, spreading that over uh, a five year period. Also, there's a stabilization fund that has been set aside, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but that clearly allows us the ability to prepare for years in which we'll have higher than expected uh, contribution amounts. So these decisions coupled with a very disciplined approach, I really want to emphasize that, a very disciplined approach to putting in what was required each year has really resulted in our current fully funded status, and we are very unique in the fact that we have a fully funded at least on an actuarial basis, a fully funded plan. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of the media attention on plans that are not fully funded. So those kind of expensive plan features where people can retire at very early ages, et cetera, you, will, you don't see those on our plan. Um, we don't offer a guaranteed cost of living to retirees, for example, which is also fairly um, expensive. Uh, we use a five-year average instead of a three-year average. So those are the things that make our plan good. However, we are not immune to all the things that are going on. And that's really what I want to spend a minute talking to you about, which is on the next slide. What are those areas of concern that even our plan, which is set up very well and is a very strong plan, what are those pressures that we're now feeling that regardless of whether we do something different will be with us? And here's what those are. So first, as you all know, um, Howard Rogg is our actuary and he calculates on an annual basis what our required contribution is. And that's the amount that we need to put into the plan to ensure that it's funded for our obligations. He uses a standard set of assumptions which are very typical on defined benefit plans and we actually revisit those with Howard every five years and we make adjustments as appropriate. So listed, uh, and I'm going to talk about all of those or give you the list of those assumptions in a minute, um, but I want to go through the few that we think are at some risk. So first is our 8% investment return. I think you all saw the article that the President sent out from the Wall Street Journal recently where there's a lot of concern nationally about whether, and that is a pretty typical investment assumption, but there's some concern about whether that can, can hold going forward. And dropping that investment return assumption would have a significant increase in the amount of funding that we would have to put into that plan. 
turnover is another issue, and I actually have a quote on here that was in some of the materials that you, some of you saw in 2006. We have a reliance on high turnover among short service employees, and that's what provides a very competitive benefit in our plan to those who vest. So employees who leave before they're vested, that money reverts back into the plan and has been a significant funder of that plan. We expect to have differences in our turnover going forward. Some of it was, is impacting us now because of the economy, but we think going forward that that's an assumption that we need to take a very strong look at. And the next one is probably a little bit obvious. It's clearly built into our funding assumption that people are living longer, but we need to take, um, we need to take that into consideration. It will just continue to put pressure on the plan. And then finally, I want to mention that we have a rapidly rising number of retirements. Most of these we, we're, are predictable because of, our, of the age of our employees. But I'll give you a sense. Last year we had 240 retirements. This year we had 400. And we expect that trajectory to increase over the next five years. And it's, it's part of the baby boomers leaving. Um, some people think it's part of what's going on in the economy right now, but we really don't believe that. Our anecdotal evidence right now tells us these are employees that have been planning this for some time. So we do anticipate a pretty significant increase in retirement. Now aside from the assumptions in the plan, there's a few other pressures on our plan that will be there regardless of whether we do something different. And one is, again, I mentioned that earlier, the changing employee needs and values. People are looking for a little more flexibility. <coughs> the other is the pressure on that we get from retirees, and it's, it's reasonable given that they don't have a built-in colon to their plan, there are requests every year for retirees to have a cost of living increase. Those are not funded on the current plan. So when those are voted in on an ad hoc basis, it adds a significant liability to the plan, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that toward the end. And then, of course, we're all familiar with the instability in the state revenue situation. And then finally, we believe there are changes coming in governmental accounting standards. We don't have all the final information on that, but it could mean that we have to book some liabilities that we weren't, that we're not currently doing. So those are all the reasons why, while we have a very good plan, we have some concerns about that plan. And that's what's led us to kind of look forward. Well, would, would you, do you want questions as we go through? Would sure, you? I'd be okay. happy to. Uh, and, and I think there have been several, quite a few articles in the Wall Street the last six weeks or two months about all these issues. And there was one, I think, about the state of Missouri, a chart which showed, uh, uh, I think, the state had modified its plan. I mean, just so I understand a little bit, I mean, I'm, my retirement date has gotten moved back by Social Security and other economic. I mean, I, I'm, I'm in a defined contribution plan, and so my defined contribution plan is not, just as our defined benefit plan is not doing well. It's not because we're defined benefit, it's because the stock market's not doing well. Okay. So my defined contribution plan is not doing well, and that too has forced me to move my uh, uh, retirement date back, uh, that, that, uh, that and a 13-year-old. But uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, can't we modify our plan? I mean, what, what would be the effect of moving our retirement back date back to 70, for example, so, so that people had to wait till they're 70 to get a full benefit? What, what, what effect would that have on the numbers we're looking at? Well, I can't tell you the exact effect, but clearly what we could do are changes to the plan. But as President Forsey talked about, that's been extremely unpopular viewpoint of employees. I mean, when you're looking to reduce the cost of the plan, there are a number of ways to do it, and one would be to reduce the features of the plan. But it does, I mean, that's just clearly not something that people that are in the plan now would want to see. But, but it's definitely... Would, would definitely and, and, decrease and, and, and the cost. I, and I can appreciate they don't want to see it. That, that I, I, at the same time, I didn't want to see them increase the Social Security retirement date, and I didn't want to. You know, I think we're all in this boat together, and it, it, it's a it's a society issue. Uh, so I, I would still like to understand what would happen if we were to modify our plan in several ways to reduce its cost, and how that would relate to what we're going to talk about. We can certainly model that. I mean, that's one of the reasons we put in the employee contribution a year, a year and a half ago, is that we considered a number of options, and one of them could have been to reduce the, the plan benefits, either through raising age or simply reducing the amount of the benefit. But the lesser of those evils was to put in the employee contribution. And most employees, while they're not happy to pay the contribution, would prefer that over making a plan design change. But we could certainly model that. I don't, I don't know if Mr. Mr. Raw could, 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 off the top of his head, give us a 
Howard, do you have a sense off the top of your head what it what it what it would do to the cost to in, to raise the normal retirement age? I don't think you would do it for retirees. You would do it only for people currently in service of the university. Yeah, so be current. Please, current. So you're going to do it for current active people, and not just for future active people. Uh, what, what you're seeing is a lot of changes recently made in state plans. It's changing retirement age. I'm pushing back. Uh, and I'm pushing back. I think it's really important. I think it's good that after we're going uh, up to that 65, a lot of the changes were because people had on these benefits at 55, couple of interesting points here. One is that um, we don't have, as I mentioned, some of those bells and whistles that make plans expensive. And so a lot of employees had very early retirement possibilities. And so rather than raise the normal retirement age, they've eliminated some of those early retirements. And we don't have those. So that's one of the um, one of the issues that would be harder for us to deal with. And then the second point he made is that reducing benefits for, from what someone considers they have already earned, whether it's legal or not is, is, a, is a very troublesome way to go. It usually does create problems for you, whether it's technically legal or not, people do a lot of pushback. So it would be something you'd really have to look at going forward. Uh, let me, uh, yeah. a couple questions. Sure. Yes, sir. What? Wayne, would you lean up so that people can hear, please? Can't hear? For a defined contribution plan, you have some projection, I would assume, on employee contribution levels. Do we have a projection now? Yes. We, we do not. We know what a lot of our peers are doing, um, but as I'm going to get into in a minute, um, they don't consider years of service. And I think that's really built into our culture, so it's something I think we need to talk about. So our peers are about 9% is what they're contributing on the employer side. But that has come down almost a point in just the My last year. The question was on the employee side. Would oh, be, I'm sorry. Employee side. side, our peers are doing a little over 5%. I think the average is 5.5%. That's a mandatory contribution. Okay. And then they can contribute and, more than that, and the match goes up. Most of them don't allow you to contribute more and get a match, but there are definitely, if you look outside our peer group, there are definitely lots of institutions that have a lower mandatory, but employees can um, increase that contribution with a match from the employer. Okay, my, my question is this then, so we can look at various options as we yes. go forward. If whatever that figure is projected to be for employees for a defined contribution, if that was applied to our present defined benefit plan, what would the impact of that be moving forward? What would that do? If employees are going to be paying that, and I know it's just new employees, mm -hmm. that you're thinking about it now. Oh, I see your question. But yeah. if all employees were to pay, make a contribution, which they do now, Mm -hmm. based on what changes. But, in, but now they're in a de result. doing it to a defined it, it, contribution. Yeah, that up. Maybe in steps, maybe at whatever level. I you, see. Because that would obviously impact 
the cost to the university of this right. uh, of this plan. Yeah, I, I would like to see that. Uh, the other thing I would like to see that came to mind when you were talking about this is: Have you put a cost? Well, have you made a projection on the phase out of the present plan? I assume that the plan would probably have a maybe a 40 plus year phase out unless <clears throat> when you got down to a certain number you bought everybody out or whatever but at some you know you're going to have employees that have started in the last few years that may be with the university for 40 years um, and as and you projected the increase in retirements. So obviously over this 40 years, there's going to be a shrinking amount of people going into the plan. There's going to, it's going to reduce um, uh, the, uh, for example, the benefit we get when employees work for less than five years and leave and that money right. uh, falls over there. So. I would like to see the, I guess, a picture of what happens over 40 years sure. as you shift from all the employees you have now down to the handful or whatever's left when you, when it's closed down or projected to close down or however, however that works, okay. and its effect on uh, the contribution the university has to continue to make there, coupled with the cost of the contribution that the university would be making to the, the defined um, uh, contribution plan. Because it, it just seems to me that the two of those together are going to be a bigger number rather than a smaller number, but you know, I assume that you've looked at this to some extent. Yes. Be Betsy, before we, we continue, a, a primary objective for today's ongoing discussion on this matter is to take an inventory of the issues and questions that members of the board have. And there have been two or three very, very important ones, yours certainly at the top of the list. And I think it's important that we make inventory of those questions and prepare the responses. I think it's, it's important that we all understand that there are a lot of hypotheticals that go into these questions. And, and it may be that it would be good to record the questions and prepare the answers and if we uh, can address some of those that require more calculation that we just do that at the planned committee meeting in November rather than put Betsy on the spot of trying to you know wing an answer because I, I think this is really important stuff I, ho I hope we can maybe get a good uh, inventory of questions today and maybe not not expect uh, answers to there there are an endless number of permutations of hypotheticals that you could do if, if that's acceptable to the board Mr. Chairman that's what I was asking for Put these questions on the list. Okay. Get answers later. If Betsy wants to reflect on something she knows about it, fine. Sure. But, but um, other than that, I would I agree with what you're saying. Curator Good, I would tell you that your questions are really at the heart of the issue, and that's really what President Forsey said we're going to be doing um, going forward. I will point out both of those questions um, Howard is working on as we speak. Um, and should have them in a couple of weeks. He did present some of that material last summer because those were the two similar questions. Um, what's changed a little is what's going on with our peers on their defined contribution. So Howard's updating his information, but we will definitely have that for you. And we could send that out well in advance of the November meeting because I believe Howard's going to have that done in a couple of weeks. Um, okay, so um, this is just a picture of our current plan. I think most of you are pretty familiar with our current plan. So if we move to the next page, I want to focus a minute on the funding of the current plan. Um, I told you earlier that we were worried, mostly worried about three of the uh, assumptions, and they're in bold up here on the, on the list. Um, but all of these go into the actuarial calculation that Howard does. Um, and as I mentioned, these are revisited um, every five years. So are there any questions on the actuarial assumptions? Let's take a look at the results of the actuarial assumptions, and here's a picture of the last 15 or 16 years and then some projections. 
And you all have seen this chart a few times, I believe, and let's just go through it briefly. And of course, this is the history of uh, the required contributions and the amount that the university has actually put in. And they've varied anywhere from 2% to 9% over the last 15 years. As we're predicting for the future, we suddenly see that we will most likely cross that 9% level, and we haven't been over 9% in over 30 years. You only see a 15 year here, but if you actually look over 30 years, we've never been above uh, or maybe just slightly above 9%. And of course, that's due to the significant market downturn in 08 and 09. And as you recall from my earlier notes, we spread those losses across five years. Otherwise, you would see a much steeper spike going on in the, in the four projected years up there. So beginning in 2010, you see a red part on the blue bar there, and that's, of course, the employee contribution. And that averages to about 1.3%. Some employees only pay 1%, and those that cross the $50,000 <coughs> salary during the year start paying 2%. So that averages to about 1.3%. The university actually budgets at 7%, and that started a number of years ago. So although the there's a fluctuation in the funding requirement, the university is budgeting for 7%. Well, what happens to the difference? Because in many years, the university doesn't need to put 7% into the retirement plan. That goes into a stabilization fund that was created a couple of years ago. And currently that fund, well, by the end of this fiscal year, that fund will have $65 million in it. And the point was to protect for those years where we had some slight increases. Unfortunately, we're not looking at slight increases in the next four years. We're looking at pretty significant increases. They're only projections. Howard will continue um, to do our year-by-year -year analysis, and each year we'll look at another four or five years of a projection. But clearly, if you follow the numbers here, we will have to dip into that stabilization fund, or the alternative is we dip in a little into the stabilization fund and we have to increase either the employee or the employer contribution into those plans. So those are all things that would be considered as we see those final numbers um, that are coming up. Betsy, um, yes. what rate of return is assumed for the future years? 8%. And that's the assumption that I mentioned earlier that, you know, could be at risk. But that's built into these assumptions, the, I mean to these rates. And the contribution rates uh, for those future years are assuming um, that we don't dip into the stabilization fund and, and that's what we would have to come up with? Correct. I mean, so the, the, that begs the question of what would we do if, so if the rate went to 12 percent and the employees are only paying 1.3, is the university paying the entire remainder and thereby putting great pressure on our budgets or are we dipping into the reserve? Are we increasing the employee contribution? Those are all issues to be determined. And yes. I carry down, I think that's, that's the point of, we started with the health care costs, which that's a, you know, a 10 percent, 13 percent increase. Uh, that the university piece will have to deal with, and that's in the context of what we know is going to be a challenging budget year. So these things kind of pile on while we're trying to address the salary issues. So well, I made the point it's the same pot of money, and those trade-off decisions become, become a challenge absent some new revenue source. Years 2012 through 2015, assume the 8 percent? Yes, absolutely. Two things. Can you – maybe it's not possible to do. The actuaries take this out further? Yes. Um, Howard, I assume you can take this out as far as we want you to take it out, correct? Sure. 
So the two added together versus, uh, versus Yeah, the this. two plans uh, and projecting like, out. Like three scenarios. Okay. Howard, this is David Wasinger. Could you also run some projections? We're assuming an 8% rate of return. Uh, maybe you can do it by percentages as to what the funding difference would be. If not, can you run a rate of return of, say, 6% and what the funding are? Because as I'm looking at this, you're projecting in 2014 a jump to $120 million to fund this plan, and right now we are at $60 million. You're looking at $60 million jump in, in costs that could be used for salary increases. God only knows what. How big does that figure get if we have a six percent? If we use a six percent return, we we did that uh, calculation. We'll, we'll do, we'll last do that. Year we'll do that. Can you do it again? I've I've forgotten what it is. Yeah, last year that was about a three hundred and fifty or four hundred million dollar. Yeah, it's it's really significant. Unfunded liability. Yeah, it's very significant. You know, Betsy, I I, I should have asked this when we uh, uh, voted for the uh, employee contribution. Mm -hmm. My memory is we have cliff vesting. Yes. Okay. Yes. And you mean once you vest your? Well, well, you, you, the first five years or so, there's no nothing. vest. That's nothing. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and and because of that, I guess I should have asked. But if I'm a new employee, a new hire, and I put in one percent of my salary for four years, and then I then I either ask to leave or, or I leave voluntarily, I don't take any of my own. Do I take my own? You country? take your own. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. With, with a little bit of interest. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So so you you are at least protected under our existing plan. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, my next slide um, talks about just briefly some of the changes that have occurred on the plan, and I'm not going to go through these in detail. I believe you all have seen this before as well. Um, the next slide uh, goes a little bit into this issue about the retiree pension adjustments, and I really just want to point to the bottom line. Um, I don't show you every year up here, but I do total years 1990 through 2010, and that's a $104.7 million liability that was added to the plan when those pension adjustments were, were put in. And this is probably the, the most difficult issue, I think, in dealing with the, with the current plan. We do have an option for retirees to select a cost of living adjustment. It obviously lowers the initial benefit, and so many, most of them do not um, elect to take that. Okay, if we move to the next slide, um, we are not going to get into exact uh, features of a, of a defined contribution because, as the President said, we don't have a, a specific plan in mind yet, but this is how a typical defined contribution plan works, and I think we've been through um, most of this already. The bottom line is we can design a plan in just about any way that we need to to meet any kind of cost structure. We have to decide what our objectives are, and that's really what I want to leave you with today. So on the next slide, um, we talk briefly about keeping in mind that risk mitigation is really our main objective here. And then we need to establish those other objectives and how they would affect the plan features. And so my last slide gives you a sense of the kind of objectives that we've been out talking to employees about. How competitive do we want to be? How much risk sharing do we want to have? What's our attraction and retention for talent? And I would mention here that what attracts someone isn't necessarily what keeps them here. And while our, this, and this is where it really drives plan design. So, for example, most of our peers have immediate vesting. The person gets day one, they get first dollar of the employer contribution that they can take with them. That does not promote retention. It may be very attractive, but it doesn't necessarily promote retention. And so, again, a plan feature might be that we have some kind of graduated vesting so that people find the plan attractive but it does reinforce uh, retention. That's particularly important to us considering our total compensation picture with our salaries in particular. Bene benefit adequacy, how much retirement do we need to be concerned about that people have? Is this their only um, access to retirement funds? Again, I mentioned link to uh, longer service. Program complexity, we can design a very complex program that meets all our objectives, be difficult for people to understand, and be difficult to administer. Equality between groups. This gets pretty interesting on a defined contribution plan. If you have a high mandatory <coughs> employee contribution, how do you deal with employees at lower salary levels? So this has to be um, worked through. And of course, cost sharing between employee and employer. And then finally, program costs. What's tricky about these objectives, and hopefully you notice this as I went through them, they don't fit nicely together. They're often at odds with each other. So you may want to have the lowest cost plan 
For example, you may want to match the amount that we pay on a defined benefit, but you'd have to structure it in a way that you wouldn't be able to meet all these objectives in order to have that cost. So we have to weigh these objectives and figure out which ones are the most important and what we want to focus on and how we want to structure the plan. And then, of course, we can, we can figure out exactly what a plan like that would cost and what impact it would have on our current defined benefit plan. I've also included some information in the appendix, which I was not going to go through with you today. It's just starting to build the information that we will be giving to you um, in November, including the results of some of the questions that you all have posed today. I had a question about the process. Um, you know, at some point, I assume we're going to have a, a, an array of alternatives, mm -hmm. defined contribution plan alternatives. Correct. And it, so at the, at the December meeting, is it contemplated, I'm sorry, at, at the December meeting, is it contemplated that we're going to vote uh, to move to a particular alternative or not to move at all? or? or we need to be able to compare what our current plan is versus an alter a specific alternative as opposed to just comparing it to a nebulous contribution plan. And I, I, think I don't know what stage along the way we'll get yeah. to that point. Do you want to take that? Yeah. Well, the, the board's duty is to constantly review these things. It, there, there's drama because this is the, a time when we're really looking at it deeply, but we have been reviewing this as long as I've been on the board, and for those of you who are in your final year, I think you've looked at this maybe two or three times. So we're, we're constantly reviewing this, and our process is leading us to a deeper examination of one alternative, which would be limited only to new employees. That's one alternative, but our process is allowing for uh, the staff to engage the stakeholders of the university, including the employees, the faculty, and others, in a dialogue about that. And I believe the plan is to have that dialogue over the month of October and to genuinely hear what they have to say and to bring that feedback back to the comp committee. And so it, it's frustrating, I'm sure, to sit here and say, well, what are we talking about? Well, the truth is, is we don't know what we're talking about yet because we're in a process that's going to treat with respect, the feedback that we get from our employees and narrow the discussion to alternatives in a likely November meeting of this committee and only if there is a, an evolving consensus that all of the stakeholders have participated in might we consider an actual uh, change. But I think the thing that really impresses me about this is that what the president said at the outset. Nothing that's being talked about currently is, involves current retirees. Nothing involves current employees. We are talking about adjustments that we will engage in a dialogue about that would affect only future employees. And I'm sure that when Betsy and the president come back from their dialogue with stakeholders, their, their thinking will, will be adjusted and, and it's, a, it's a work in progress, as Betsy said. So. I think the answer to your question, the shorter answer is, is this is a process that leads to input, that leads to a, another committee meeting, which leads to the possibility of consideration, but there's no, no certain plan. Does the President have anything yeah, on? And I think part of what, uh, what I try to say up front is the, the discussion of a defined contribution plan, we would like to be able to engineer it so that it doesn't have an unintended consequence on the defined benefit plan, whether it's next year or 40 years from now. What is confusing to employees is that, as Betsy went through, there are some fundamental assumptions underlying the current defined uh, pension plan that if we didn't do anything, could change the relationship with employees. We may have to go, based on what David said, and ask employees to contribute more. Uh, we may have to go in and rejigger uh, some of the expectations because of an unfunded liability if, in fact, interest rates are, are required to be changed either by, by the federal government or by us as a, uh, administrators and the board deciding that's the right thing to do. So that's what is confusing employees. We say no impact, but that's no impact if we design it the right way of, of an alternative that would mitigate the risk. But if we do nothing, I think we also have to reconcile that uh, risk is building and growing because of these, again, unintended consequences that have, that have resulted uh, on, on the plan design. 
I, I would highlight for you the one that I'm most concerned about is most plans in my experience, whether it is selling minutes or selling networks, when plans are built on an assumption of breakage, um, when, when those assumptions change, bad things typically happen, and we're going to see that as we reduce employee churn. We're going in trying to shore up employees. We want employees to stay. We don't want to make an investment in employees to leave. So concentrated effort of reducing employee churn uh, you know, is going to be rocking the foundation because our plan was built on high employee churn, particularly pointed at lower paid employees. So as a hospital now is pursuing the Baldrige criteria, for example, key focus is on, on employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction. We want employees to invest in staying uh, employees the university. So that's counter to a plan, as Betsy said, back to what this board reviewed a few years ago, uh, the plan is funded on high employee churn. That's not, that's not, a, good, that's not a good calculus. And that's, that's playing out as we speak, driven by the recession more so than trying to reduce uh, employee churn because of being a better place to work. I understand the process, and I, and I appreciate the process, and I think it's a good process to solicit input. It's just difficult, and I, and I know this is really our first time we've really had to discuss it recently. I know we've talked about it since I've been on the board. Uh, but it's difficult to compare a, a def our current plan in the abstract to a plan we don't know what the details are. And, and I agree that we need to get input from all quarters to consider all the possible alternatives. But my only point is at some point, uh, and I think Wayne's questions are very good, at some point, we've got to compare the costs and benefits of staying where we are, and there are costs and there are benefits, versus the costs and benefits of switching to a particular alternative plan or, or alternative plans right. and weigh all those. And, and I, I realize that's at the end of the process, and I, and I like the process that you we, we will have some costs for you in November. We'll be able to do some various and I, structures. And I think we'll have costs. scenarios and, and different okay. structures, I mean, trying to deal with new employees that are 25 years old versus an employee that's a faculty member that's transferring in when they're 53 years old. So I think those different structures, because culturally we want to be an attractive place, we're going to have to not just have a one-size-fits-all approach, I suspect. Betsy, I think you and Gary have done a very good job in terms of outlining this. I think the materials you provided to the board were excellent. And in referencing the board materials, I think this sums it up, the example that is provided in here, in that assume what they call state A, I'll call it the University of Missouri, has a defined benefit plan with an actual required contribution rate of 10%. If we conduct a probability study that shows there's a 50% chance, in other words, it may be a 6% return, that within the next five years, poor investment could, experience could occur and the required contribution rate could increase to as high as 20 percent, the university needs to decide whether it can, can or cannot afford to take that risk. I always am of the belief, hope for the best, plan for the worst. And I think if you, we need to plan, particularly with the state of the economy right now, I think for less than 6, 8 percent return on the investment. Here's the option I would like to see addressed, and again, I, no decisions have been made. I'm in favor of keeping the current plan intact for current employees. But what I'd like to say, if we are looking at an unfunded liability of $350 million, that's not a University of Missouri problem. That is a state of Missouri problem. And I think we should follow suit, as all the other colleges and universities in the state of Missouri and other colleges and universities in other states, there needs to be a look, hard look at whether or not the defined benefit plan should be rolled into the Moser's plan. And I think there was legislation last year about the Missouri Department of Transportation, which also has a defined benefit, standalone benefit plan, whether or not it should be rolled into the Moser's plan. I say that for the risk analysis, number one. But secondly, Moser's, that's all they do is manage these funds. This consumes a tremendous amount of the board time. This and the athletic department are the two top topics. <laughs> Moser's has a board. All they do is manage that fund. They do it for judges, which is a unique retirement plan. They could do it for ours, which may differ a little bit from the, but, but I think we need to take a very hard look at rolling this defined benefit plan into Moser's, handing them off, let them manage it. That's all they do. And we do not, both from an administrative standpoint, not because of the capability, do not have the staffing, the expertise, 
and the board, frankly, does not have the time to devote to all these issues. So that's the option that I would like to see looked at in terms of rolling that defined benefit plan, and we may require legislation, Steve, in terms of doing so, but I think the Missouri Department of Transportation and another standalone defined benefit entity, there was legislation that was pending last year, and I don't know why the university was reluctant to join in that, in that mix. It was mostly based on cost. The measure plan is significantly higher contribution rate than our plan. I'd like to see that and uh, see if we have a standalone plan, and uh, if, if we keep it the same, sure. what happens on that? Onto that, it's primarily because of their early retirement Correct. benefits and so forth, which they've just changed for new employees, as you know. I'm not advocating rolling our plan in, but if we did, it would be based on our cost and their cost. And Betsy, when I say that, and yeah, Wayne, I would I'm saying, yeah. for example, judges in Missouri, yeah. they have a very unique retirement plan. Yes, they do. Moser's runs their plan, Moser's runs the faculty at Missouri State University, uh, they, they have a defined benefit for the staff, whoever has a defined benefit plan. That is run by Mosers. This thing is a state of Missouri problem and not a University of Missouri problem, and I think we need to take a good hard look at that. You know, and I think that would be a good debate and a good discussion. Uh, I, I myself would take the other view that perhaps, you know, I think we've done an excellent job of, and I don't mind the time we spend on this, it's, it, it, it's been worthwhile, I think we, we may do a better job, and I'm not a big fan of subcontracting out your responsibilities. But, uh, th you know, th that'll be a great discussion, and we need the information as you request it. Uh, uh, three quick points I would like to make. Uh, first of all, we're obviously spending a lot of time on this, and it's, it's probably because it's the most important thing we're going to decide here in the next few months. I, I, I guess I would kind of prefer you put it off until January, but, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but I don't know if that'll happen or not. Uh, I guess my, my, my personal thought process out of love for the university is we do it before you get new, new, new curators on because the educational process is so important here. Uh, I think if there's a reason we're discussing it at, at this length, and it's the third or fourth time since I've been on the board, because it is one of the more pressing issues out there, and it is something that we're going to have to deal with. It's not going to be an easy issue. Uh, I, I still like to understand things, and so the uh, the next point is I, I, I would like to understand plan design and, and how this works. I, my, my memory was at one point we were told that if we were to switch to defined contribution versus defined benefit, that we, we currently use the cliff vesting or the five-year vesting rule to help fund and that, that, that we would hit that, we, we, we would be more expensive as, as we lost that, that those five-year forfeitures. So I just want to understand what that number is and how that works. And, and, and finally, um, uh, I, 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 Mr. Rogg, were you at the meeting, and I think it was in 2006, and I didn't bring that, my notes on that. Uh, there was a, we had a really detailed presentation and discussion, and we talked about this as a board. Uh, one of the discussion points was the value we bring to our employees, and that was that Whatever our rate of return is, we have done an excellent job through our, we, we've done better than most people managing our assets. And, and the discussion was what would happen if we were to switch to defined contribution and we were to allow employees or force employees, I guess I would like to allow employees, not force employees, to opt out into individually in, independent investment decisions or decisions within how they invested. But my memory was that the speaker at that presentation pointed out that historically collectively managed funds such as ours, whether it be defined benefit or defined contribution, achieve a higher overall rate of return in allowing your employees to, to make their own investment decisions because they really don't have the background to make those decisions. And as a result of that, their historical performance is less than what we as a, we as a university have been able to achieve for our employees' benefits. So if somebody could, I don't need the answer now, but it, I yes, want to make sure I understand that. That's true. It's in the materials from 2006. And it was Alex Sussman's um, report, who was the actuary um, that preceded Howard. Okay. And, uh, he did, he that. Are there, uh, uh, Wayne? John, I don't know if we're about to wrap this up. Yes, sir. Uh, certainly, I understand the potential risk. I think we, we all do. And that 
um, may go badly or may not go badly, but it's a risk. We all understand it. I, I would like to see at the, well, as early as possible in the process, but in the final meeting on, the, on this, which I guess is December, unless as John said he moves off, uh, that we not have just one alternative, that we can, there are various alternatives that can minimize the risk and address the problem. I think we ought to have the opportunity when we're voting to look at those, discuss those, uh, whether it becomes a hybrid or whatever, but we ought to look at various ways to solve, uh, solve the problem, which is the risk. Um, and then a, a kind of a minor thing, but uh, when you have the November meeting, uh, can we make sure we have a telepresence look up for, for that? Uh, yeah, the, meet, the meeting is set for November 1st, and it, it is going to be done by telepresence. Uh, many of us will be in Kansas City with Curator Erdman, but telepresence is available. That would be, okay, good. Yeah, and I, I think maximum participation. Yeah. I, I would not. Uh, agree that bringing multiple choice to the board uh, for a decision in December would be the right solution. I would agree that multiple choice is being vetted between now and November and in November, but to bring a decision to the board and ask for debate and discussion, uh, I, I think that would be a very bad process, Mr. I, Chairman. So. I agree. I think that's the purpose of the committee. Yeah. All board members are welcome to attend the committee meeting in November. Yeah. They're not welcome to vote. Do you have the uh, magnitude of the, of the savings? The magnitude of the savings of the, uh, by each of the options that, that you'd be looking at? Yeah, I mean, I think we can take what, you know, that one bar chart and start to work against that based on our known cost increase and try to deal with, again, the fixed cost aspect of a defined contribution plan. However, we Stage it in by short spend. term and the long term. Long -term. You've got, you know, if you've got this turnover rate yeah. that has declined, uh, and you've got a mortality rate that yeah. is lengthened. Uh, this has got some differential is, is equation. The, is the savings going to become so marginal? I'm assuming the answer that's going to be no. I'm hoping that will be no. But if it does, then you raise the question: Is it worth making? It yeah, and I think it's, well, yeah, we need yeah. to solve that. I, I kind of want to just reiterate, because this is being webcast, and there are a lot of people listening to this across the state, and a lot of them are listening at the edge of their seat, possibly, that today really, as I said at the outset, is the continuation of an ongoing dialogue with the university and its stakeholders. And today, Curators had the opportunity to lay on the table issues, questions, alternatives, and approaches that you want fleshed out, and I think good notes were taken. Between now and the next meeting of the committee in November, uh, we're going to engage in dialogue with our stakeholders, and out of that will come a lot of valuable input. One thing that Gary said that, that I really took to heart was that we're attempting to design the best alternative for new employees that we can because we really want to minimize any impact on existing employees and retirees. Others may have a different view of that. Some have expressed other views today. I, I myself want to minimize or possibly eliminate any impact on existing employees and retirees. And that's why the president and his team are going through this painstaking process to hear from stakeholders to try to customize a design plan that, to curator uh, Don's point of view, can be compared against the existing plan. And I think that's what we're working toward. Unfortunately, on this day in September, we don't have that straw man, but we will. Uh, and I think by the time we get to December, if, if we bring something forward, then the choices will be very clear. So I, I want to thank everybody for their, their participation. I know the President and Betsy are uh, committed to providing responses to the comments that were made today, and today we had another good discussion on this really important issue. 
If there are no other uh, comments for today on this issue, we will uh, publish and notice the meeting of the committee in November and invite uh, all participants to uh, participate at that time. The only other action of the committee today is uh, to uh, go into closed session to consider several personnel matters. Uh, and so I would entertain a motion to go into closed session to entertain those personnel matters. Been moved? Second. And seconded. Uh, Secretary will call the roll. Yes. 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 I believe that concludes the work of the committee, Madam Chairman, and so I turn the meeting back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um,